The Democratic National Committee has issued corrections to previous left-wing convictions that have now become inoperative. In a pamphlet, which was immediately adopted as the formal style book of the New York Times, a former newspaper, the DNC said it, quote, wish to clarify our previous statements of deeply held belief in order to eliminate any misapprehension that we were telling the truth when we made them, which might hamper our descent into unconscionable hypocrisy, unquote. First among the statements was believe all women. The DNC pamphlet says, quote, Obviously, we were just kidding. Can anyone take a joke anymore? After all, women make up approximately 50% of the world's liars, making it impossible to know whether they are telling the truth or not without careful investigation by the FBI in the case of Republicans and by the DNC in the case of Democrats. Only after it is determined whether the accused is a Republican or a Democrat can we know whether the woman should be in the first place believed or in the second ignored, then rejected, then quietly destroyed, unquote. A second statement that is now inoperative is, dissent is patriotic. The pamphlet says, quote, this is a simple typo, and we actually meant dissent is patriotic, meaning any protest that descends from Marxist radicalism and is intended to destroy the country to which patriots feel patriotic is patriotic, whereas patriotic dissent calling for freedom and economic reopening is unpatriotic because it's spelled differently, unquote. This brings the pamphlet to the third statement, flatten the curve, which the pamphlet says, quote, was clearly intended as straightforward advice to sinker ball pitchers in baseball and should not imply any promise that we would reopen the economy after protecting our hospitals, as that might result in the reelection of Donald Trump, whereupon believe all women and dissent is patriotic would instantly become operative again. And the printing costs of this pamphlet would be a total loss. Trigger warning. I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. Life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing. Hunky dunky doo. Ship shaped tipsy topsy. The world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day. Hurrah, hooray! It makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray! Oh, hooray, hurrah! So these protests, uh, Pardon me, against lockdown orders are now spreading through the country. Over the weekend, there were protests in Chicago, Los Angeles, Sacramento, Raleigh, North Carolina, among other places. My personal favorites were the protests to open the California beaches, one of which featured a guy holding a sign with a surfboard on it and the defiant words, come and take it. So so points for hilarity there. I support these demonstrations, even though they carry dangers, and here's why. First, just as a reminder, let me point out that in the same way I've resisted left-wing fear-mongering and China-justifying during the current crisis, I've also opposed right-wing posturing about our sacred liberties. I felt and I still feel that our sacred liberties are only under attack in certain isolated places and not in any systemic way. This doesn't mean there are no civil rights violations going on. There sure are, and cops who are doing stuff like that should knock it off. And I do think it's fair to worry that the current emergency procedures could be used by left-wingers as an excuse to deprive us of liberty in the future, but sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, so I'll worry about that when the time comes. But I support the current protests for a different reason. They're local, and it's important to notice that they're local. Donald Trump, in one of the single greatest acts of his presidency, has maintained our federal system during this pandemic and has left it to each state to determine what sort of reopen plan their situation requires. That's just common sense, but it's also good old-fashioned American law. Not every governor and mayor has responded wisely or in a freedom-loving way. They've ordered us to lock down to keep our hospitals from being overrun. Fair enough. Now that the hospitals seem to be safe, Why isn't lockdown giving way to sensible reopening accompanied by recommended health procedures? What are the plans? What's the timeline? What's a realistic step-by-step design that will both help us protect ourselves, but also give us back our lives, our liberties, and our economy? I'm talking to people in New York City, and as far as they know, they'll be staying in their tiny apartments forever. They're getting no word whatsoever about when this ends or what the plan is. They just don't know. The severity of the Chinese disease and all the factual unknowns that there were made this, I think, a legitimate emergency. That emergency has passed. So, too, should the state, cities, and emergency powers. They should let go. Why are there reopen plans in some states and not in others? Well, look, it could be that Gavin Newsom in California and Andrew Cuomo in New York and Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan have tyrannical leanings. Maybe they do. But what I think we're actually witnessing from them is rooted in simple political cowardice. With a corrupt left-wing press pushing fear and loathing in order to get at Trump, there's no media reward for these governors to reopen. 
And there is political danger that the inevitable spike in Chinese flu cases after the reopen will be turned into a plague by hysterical reporting and used to bludgeon these governors back into panic. That is already happening. So the governors are scared. They're scared of the press. But if your goal is social distancing and sane behavior, and your lockdown orders are so draconian that honest Americans are gathering en masque and unmasked in protest, you're not accomplishing your goal. So what are you going to do? You're going to arrest everybody? Or is it time to listen to and work with everybody as that evil, horrible, no good, very bad Donald Trump has been doing pretty much throughout? People who despise Donald Trump need to show at least as much courage as Donald Trump has and begin the process of letting us get back to work. All right, let me, before I uh, start to talk about Rad Power Bikes, our sponsor, let me thank all our sponsors for sticking with us. We know this is a tough time, especially for small businesses. We know it's a tough time for the people who uh, patronize our sponsors. So we hope you will patronize our sponsors if and when you can. And we thank our sponsors for sticking with us, including Rad Power Bikes, because not only have they been uh, loyal and devoted, they also are just cool. I mean, a Rad Power Bike is just what it sounds like. It is a Rad Power Bike. You can pedal it, you can use the motor. It's a cross between a traditional bike and a moped, but it does doesn't require a special driver's license like a moped would. You can go up to 20 miles per hour without pedaling so you can get out and get about without getting sweaty. It's nice, you know, especially now when you want to just get out of your house at least and get some sun. They're great for commuting, getting out on the trail, hauling groceries, or even transporting your kids on the back. Unlike other e-bikes, they're actually affordable. Plus, to show appreciation for those that serve us, Rad Power Bikes is offering 100 bucks off all e-bike purchases for active ex-military, first responders, teachers, and students. If you know someone who loves being active outdoors, Tell them about Rad Power Bikes. They offer flexible financing for as low as 0% APR. And right now, as a limited time offer, get a free accessory with the purchase of a bike. That's right, a free gift of up to $100 in value and free shipping to the lower 48 states. To get this special offer, text the word POWER to 64000. That's POWER to 64000. Text P-O-W-E-R to 64000. So today, May 4th, is 50 years since the Kent State Massacres. Uh, four students, if you don't know what this was, four students were killed during a student protest uh, by National Guardsmen. The National Guard fired on the student protesters, and four of them were killed. Uh, it was a, a protest against Nixon expanding the Vietnam War into Cambodia. It was absolute chaos. There was They don't know why it happened exactly. There's some talk that there was a, a broken light bulb that sent a pop-off, and the National Guardsmen thought they were under to fire. It was just chaos. It was botched crowd control is what it was. It was a, a botched crowd control. One thing that nobody will tell you but me is it was a political victory for the administration, right? It wasn't a moral victory, right? When young Americans are killing other young Americans, that's not a moral victory. But it was a political victory. There were big protests afterwards, huge protests across the country. You probably heard the famous song, Ohio, uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, I think it was, Tin Soldiers and Nixon coming. We're finally on our own. This summer, I heard the drumming, Four Dead in Ohio. It was banned on a lot of AM stations, but it was played on a lot of FM stations. But, but, the people sided with the guard. The, the people, by something like 58%, sided with the guard. The protests after that petered out, which is why Nixon had been elected on a law and order platform, and Nixon won in a landslide in 1972. But here's the thing, right? It's a tra it was a tragedy. It was a terrible tragedy. It's botched crowd control. This happens all the time. Once you get into these protests, things can go terribly wrong. Nixon and Agnew spoke with disdain about the protesters. And, and today, who's speaking with disdain about the protesters who want to reopen? The Washington Post, they just call them, and they're a bunch of anti-vaxxers and evangelicals and these guys. They don't really. It's, a, it's, it's a astroturf. Lori Lightfoot in Chicago, Bill de Blasio in New York, speaking with disdain, also bringing out the big guns and threatening arrest. The point here is not who's right or wrong. The point is the disconnect between the government and the people, the disregard for the feelings of the people. It doesn't matter. It, you know, I, there were dangers now uh, from this virus, just as there were dangers from Chinese communist uh, imperialism in Vietnam. But the thing is, if you work with the people, it's, it's a free country. You are leading people. You're not controlling them. If you work with the people, it does not have to be this way. Trump is doing it. The governors should too. All right. Let's just take a look the way different people are talking about this. You know, I want to read you a quote uh, from Edmund Burke. I love Edmund Burke. Edmund Burke was a great, one, of, really the founder of our kinds of uh, conservatism. He was talking in a time very much like this time when there was revolution in the air and people wanted change. But at the same time, the British uh, government was cracking down because they didn't want the revolution to come and take their monarchy away. They didn't want a revolution in their country like was happening in France. 
And Burke was just right about everything. He supported the revolutionaries in America, but he said that the revolution in France was going to turn into a bloodbath, and indeed it did. And the reason he knew that is because he knew that the Americans were operating within their tradition. They wanted their rights as Englishmen, whereas the French were trying to wipe away the entire world. They were going to wipe it away and uh, replace it with the rule of reason. And that doesn't make any sense. And basically it severs all the ties to tradition and principle and the natural ties that we have to our country and to our leaders and all these things. And here's one of the things he said. It is better to cherish virtue and humanity by leaving much to free will, even with some loss to the object. In other words, it's better to have a little less virtue and humanity, but more free will. Even if you lose some virtue and humanity, better to have free will. It's better to leave much to free will than to attempt to make men mere machines and instruments of a political benevolence. The world on the whole will gain by a liberty without which virtue cannot exist. A big theme of mine, you can't have virtue unless you choose virtue. It's not charity if the government comes and takes your money away and gives it to someone else. It's charity when you reach into your pocket and give money. And conservatives do that more than leftists because they believe in individual humanity and individual free will and in individual uh, charity and virtue. So let me just play you two clips. Here's Trump yesterday. He was with Martha McCallum. This is going to be cut 10. Martha McCallum and Brett Baer, he, they interviewed him uh, outside the Lincoln Memorial, or actually within the Lincoln Memorial, and people were allowed to send in video questions and ask him things. Uh, and here is what Trump said about the people's fears and reopening. Cut 10. I think you can really have it both ways. I think a lot of people want to go back. They just want to go back. You see it every day. You see demonstrations all over the country. And those are meaningful demonstrations. Oh, it's big stuff. But... You also have some people that are very scared. Uh, probably everybody's scared when you get right down to it. It's a terrible thing, a terrible thing that happened to our country. So, in other words, he hears both sides of the story. He's, he understands that there are two things going on, the economic uh, woes and the health woes, and he gets it. We all get it. And he was talking about the fact that 60-year-olds should stay home at Saving the Clavin. That is the president's. I mean, he doesn't want to come out and say that because it sounds a little too individual. It sounds like he's only trying to save me, which, of course, he is. That's we, what we should all be doing is save the Clavin. But he was at least talking about the fact that, yeah, you know, the older people should be more protected. The younger people, not so much. And obviously, there's going to be costs and benefits all along the way. Here's Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot, a communist. Uh, got, <laughs> got 13. We will shut you down. We will cite you. And if we need to, we will arrest you and we will take you to jail, period. There should be nothing unambiguous about that. Don't make us treat you like a criminal. But if you act like a criminal and you violate the law and you refuse to do what is necessary to save lives in the city in the middle of a pandemic, we will take you to jail, period. You tell me, you tell me where the fascists are. You tell me where the authoritarians are, where the evil Hitler, Donald Trump is. You know, this is, that was the voice that we heard, that I heard. I was there. I was there when the Kent State massacres took place. That was the voice that we did hear from the administration, that law and order voice. But the thing is, the thing is, the protesters, at least at Kent State, were rioting. These people want to go to work. They just want to go to work. They want to get out. They want to have their lives back. They want to make their own decisions. What's the right way to do that? It's to say, okay, we're reopening, but here are some things you should know. Older people are in danger. Stay home. You know, you got to have uh, social distancing even at work. Here's some health things. Because people don't want to get sick and die, and people don't want to get sick at all. You know, so they'll, they'll listen. They will listen. Who is the voice of the of authoritarianism in this country? It is now the left. If it weren't the left, if it were the right I'd probably be on the left. It is this that I oppose. It's not, again, I, I always think there are arguments to be had, there are compromises to be made. It is this. It's the shutdown of free speech. It's the shutdown of free action. It's the disbelief in the Constitution. It's the disbelief in the individual. These are the things that I oppose. And this is the reason I find myself on the right. And here's the thing. The results, their results are going to be worse. Their results. Here's Deborah Burks, the doctor in the administration, talking about the way she feels when she sees these people because in California, I think it was, I think it's Huntington Beach, which is called like Surf City, a hundredth of the population, 2,000 people out of 200,000 people poured onto the beaches, right? And this is Deborah Burks as a doctor, her reaction, uh, cut 11. It's devastatingly worrisome to me personally, because if they go home and infect their grandmother or their grandfather who has a comorbid condition and they have a serious or a very, uh, or an unfortunate outcome, they will feel guilty for the rest of our lives. So we need to protect each other at the same time we're voicing our discontent. 
So here's the thing. Obviously, with doctors, this is true of Fauci and with Burks and with all of them, they have one thing in their mind, right? First, do no harm. They have one thing, which is keeping people alive. They're not thinking about the economy. They're not thinking about the fact that the economy will kill people. And also, it's not just death. It's also the destroy, the destruction of a way of life. It's also the destruction of your business, your dreams, your hopes, everything. All of that figures in. There are plenty of people who are taking a very small chance of death, young people uh, who can go in and keep their businesses alive and other people can attend and use those businesses without that. But this is her job. It's her job. I mean, I really uh, get annoyed, especially it's on the right, too, with people, you know, calling for Fauci to be thrown out and Burks to be thrown out. No, they are the voice of their profession that, you know, you need the voice of all the different people. Donald Trump needs to hear their voices. He definitely needs to hear their voices as well as the voices of economic reopening. And so does everybody need to hear both sides of, of the problem, because it is at least a dual problem. But Here is the thing. If she is afraid, if she is afraid of what's happening, then how do you stop what's happening? How do you stop people from pouring out onto the beaches? How do you stop people from protesting? You basically got two choices. You got the Soviet choice. You got the American choice. The Soviet choice is you build walls and you arrest people and people disappear and you take them off the street. That's happening. It's happening in New York. I mean, people are being arrested in New York for just walking around, for just opening their mouths and telling the police they're wrong. Violence is, is going on. That is really happening Or you have the American way, which is, look, guys, here's the reasonable way to do this. We get it. There are two sides to this. There's the health side and the economic side. Let's work together to get this done. We are just your elected officials. We work for you. Let us help you. That's the way you do it. That is the way you govern in a free society. That is the voice of Donald Trump, except when he's talking to the press. And if the press would stop reporting on themselves, some of them might even hear the voice of Donald Trump, which is really an American voice. You know, the one place that has been going really well is in Florida. Florida is a mystery. They don't know why they haven't. They were predicting that Florida was going to be Italy. It hasn't been. They don't know whether it's because uh, of social distancing. They don't know what it's because. But one thing that did happen there, one thing that did happen was that Ron DeSantis said he's now preparing to open the state today. Right. And he let people kind of decide in their own localities what they should do. He let mayors decide. Here he is talking cut 12 about what's happening there. The only thing we have to fear is letting fear overwhelm our sense of purpose and determination. We need to focus on facts and not fear. And I think that there's been a lot that's been done to try to promote fear. We were told over and over again Florida was going to be just like New York when it came to the coronavirus. Well, let's look at the tail of the tape. How close were we to New York? Fatalities. Obviously a much different picture. It's a, it's a much, much different picture. And remember, this is where uh, a lot of the spring break stuff was happening. And some of those people went home and they went to different states. But still, this is it's much, much different. And part of the reason is because he has run that state like an American. He has run that state like an American. He has told people what's going on in your town, what's happening. Take care of it. Do what you got to do. That's the whole point of federalism. The whole point of federalism is to get the power, get the power centers as close to people as as you can. It is it is simply untrue that all power is wrong, that all state power is wrong. The state has to have power. We know this because we tried having an America without a constitution when we started, and we needed a much stronger constitution. We need power. We need centralized power. We need individual power. But the closer, the, the more power should be the, as close to the individual as possible so he can make those protests when he needs to, so he can go right to the source. And if your answer is, we will arrest you, we will take you away, we will cart you away. You've lost the plot of America. I mean, this is a thing. You know, there, there's a, a group of uh, conservatives, Art Laffer, Steve Moore from the Heritage Foundation. They're putting together a rating of the different states, 50 different states, 50 different behaviors. Who had the best behaviors? Uh, so far, apparently, Colorado, it's a Democrat, Ron DeSantis in Florida, Brian Kemp in Georgia, Pete Ricketts of Nebraska, Ken Vinstitt in Oklahoma. These are the people who have done well. And we're going to look and see this as the facts come in. We're going to see who does it. And that's because Trump has done the right and the American thing. He has let the states decide for themselves. The states should do, should do the same thing for the people. All right, let us talk about, as we're talking about our great sponsors, what is a greater sponsor than rockauto.com? Not only do they get, do a great job, but you get to say rockauto.com when you get spare parts for your car. If your car's got a problem, what do you not want to do? You do not want to get in your car and drive to the spare parts store and stand online with a bunch of other people and then have a guy breathe on you while he tells you he doesn't know anything, but will look in his computer 
you can look into your computer using rockauto.com. It's so much easier than walking into the store. The rockauto.com catalog is unique. It's remarkably easy to navigate. Rockauto.com is a family business. They've been serving auto parts customers online for 20 years. Rockauto.com, or as we like to say, rockauto.com, always offers the lowest prices possible. If you, no matter what you need, they will get it for you at the best price they can. Best of all, prices of rockauto.com are always reliably low, and they're the same for professionals. And do it yourself, selfers, why spend up to twice as much for the same parts? Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Write Claven in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know we sent you, and also write Claven in their How Do You Spell Claven box because they need to know that you know how to spell Claven. It's K L A. Weirdly, that's just what I was going to say. Uh, all right. So, you know, it's becoming clear that the press is what it is. In this, in this crisis, we have seen the press strip naked of all pretense. It, is, it really is quite amazing. Bill Maher and uh, Matt Taibbi, I think that's how you pronounce his name. He's with Rolling Stone. He's a, and they're both left wingers. They're both left wingers, but they are you know, people have I've always paid them respect because they do try to see what's going on on both sides from their left wing perspective. And they're talking about how difficult it is to get information from the press and why. This is cut number nine. This is the second cut. You're right about this. If he says something, even though he is a crazy person, if he says we should get back to work, our answer can't be dependent on, well, he said it. It has to be wrong. Yeah, it's it, we're, we're reverse engineering our attitudes on all these things, right? So, like, <laughs> yeah. you take something like hydroxychloroquine. I, when I first heard about this drug and I looked at the news stories, as soon as I saw that it was that it was referred to in headlines as the drug touted by Trump, I knew that it was going to be impossible to get any real information in the American news media about it because the the Fox slash Daily Caller people were going to say that it worked, and the people on the other side were going to say that it was. A conspiracy theory. Uh, you have to. You literally have to go to foreign news sources to try to figure out whether this drug actually works or not, because that's the important question, not whether Trump is right or wrong here. You know, I sometimes uh, hit the press for making themselves the story, but the press now is the story. They have made. They have succeeded. Congratulations. They have made themselves the story by doing exactly what Taibbi is talking about, which is reacting to everything Trump says just to get Trump in exactly the same way they did exactly the opposite to, to Obama. And it is amazing to me, and we'll talk about this Biden thing in a second. We'll talk about the Biden charges. It is amazing to me the self-blindness that we're experiencing, the, the fact that the press is actually defending itself from what is so clearly, so clearly a fair charge. They keep saying, you know, well, the Republicans are not honest. Nobody's honest. I'm not talking about the fact that Republicans are the greatest people on earth. I'm not talking about the fact that conservatives are right about everything. I'm talking about the fact that we need a free press and we don't have one. We have a press that's been corrupted and it's been corrupted by the institutions. It's been corrupted by the leftist takeover of the institutions. You know, they're talking about Sweden and the thing about Sweden is it, that's really interesting is that Sweden didn't shut down. They did give instructions on how to be careful to a people, again, who are very homogenous and very much in keep, uh, have their, their unified culture. The numbers of deaths have been very high when compared to the countries directly surrounding them, the other countries like Finland that surround them that are like them. Uh, but at the same time, we don't know if those deaths are going to be high on the long timeline because eventually people are going to come out and go to work and those people will get infected. That's the crazy logic of Eric Garcetti in L.A. saying, well, we, we did such a good job of keeping you indoors. Now you have no immune system, so you have to stay indoors forever and then you'll be safe. And you can't do that. That's just not going to work. So what Sweden is saying is, look, Everybody's going to get this eventually. Let them get it now. You know, we'll protect the uh, the old age homes, but let them get it now and we'll work it out and the economy won't be destroyed. So TV is trying to figure out what's happening in Sweden. And here is what happens to him on this. this is cut eight. I think what's so interesting is the coverage of it is is just astounding because they, they cannot get away from the narrative of this red blue argument. Like they can't just tell us right. whether or not Sweden's approach is working. They have to couch every headline uh, in, in, they're always saying things like 
uh, conservative see hope in progressive Sweden. And then if you read the, bo- the, the <laughs> body of the article, it will say something like, yes, it's working. But what the right wing doesn't understand is that this culture depends upon a strong belief in the role of the state and in, in, in society. In other words, they're seeing they're, they're couching the whole story as uh, w- what the important thing is, is whether conservatives are right or wrong about Sweden, whereas that's not what's important. What's important is, you know, is is their program working or not? And I, I think that's been a problem throughout this crisis. We cannot excise Donald Trump and the Trump argument from anything that we talk about with uh, with this this uh, this crisis, whether it's hydroxychloroquine or the WHO or whatever. And that's that's a real problem. See, you know, what's, what's to me is important and interesting about this is that it's a sophisticated analysis of what the press is doing. It's not just somebody on Fox screaming about the unfair press. That was a sophisticated analysis. The only place you hear that kind of thing is here. <laughs> you hear that from me, right? And so that the fact that these two liberals are talking like me is important. It means that something has happened during this moment when, when there's really only one news story that everybody's focusing on. I know there are other stories, but this is the big story, and it's brought this kind of focus uh, and spotlight on. And with Trump doing his uh, daily briefings, it's just been very obvious. And this Biden story has spoken to, you know, there, there are occasionally times when I look at something like this and I think, you know, maybe all the evangelicals are right. And this is like a punishment from God. You know, maybe the God is right. You know, I, I don't actually think God works that way, but I think it's, I think it is a sinful world. It's a broken world, but I don't think God says, oh, you did this. Here's a punishment for that. I, I just don't. My observation is that's not the way things work. But I sometimes wonder if God, what God is saying, in moments like this. And one of the things that is true is that every story, every story has emphasized the corruption of our press. And I believe this is the central problem in the country. I believe fixing the corruption of the press, making the press more fair, making the press more responsible to all the different sides is possibly the key thing to getting a key step to getting our freedom back. And the difficulty of it is, of course, we can't do it by law because of the First Amendment. I believe that that is right, but we have to do it by shaming. We have to do it by boycotting. We have to do it by suing when we're lied about all that stuff. And what's funny, just for comic relief here for a moment, here is Trump at this this thing with um, Martha and uh, and Brett Baer uh, at the Lincoln Memorial. And one of the people says to him, you know, I really like your press briefings and I like what you're doing and all this, but could you stop with a nasty tone toward the press? And Trump says basically, no, this is cut one. I am greeted with a hostile press, the likes of which no president has ever seen. Uh, The closest would be that gentleman right up there. They always said Lincoln. Nobody got treated worse than Lincoln. I believe I am treated worse. You're there. You see those press conferences. They come at me with questions that are disgraceful, to be honest, disgraceful. Their manner of presentation and their words. And I feel that if I was kind to them, I'd be I'd be walked off the stage. I mean, they come at you with the most horrible, horrendous, biased questions. And you see it, 94 or 95 percent of the press is hostile. And yet, if you look in Florida today, we had hundreds and hundreds of votes going up and down the intercoastal, Trump, Trump. We have tremendous support, but the media is, they might as well be in the Democrat Party. And why, I don't know. He, says, he goes on to say, why, I don't know when I'm doing such a great job. Here, so here's the joke. And, and this really is wonder, wonderful. He says, the press treats me worse than the press treated Lincoln, right? This is from Emily Jashinsky at The Federalist. The reaction from the press, okay, here's from Raw Story. Lincoln was assassinated. Disgust follows Trump's claim he is treated worse than Lincoln. And here's Yamish Alcindor, who's been held up as an actual reporter when she's obviously just a left wing activist on PBS. She says video of Trump sitting at the feet of the Lincoln Memorial saying he is being treated worse than President Abraham Lincoln, who was assassinated after freeing enslaved people across America. Just John Harwood, CNN White House correspondent. Trump tells Fox Town Hall he's treated worse than Lincoln was. Brian Tyler Cohen, nothing speaks to Fox News failure to even pretend to be a credible news source. It's not just Trump is to blame. It's Fox News. More than hearing Donald Trump claim he's being treated worse than Lincoln and not asking a follow up on that one because Trump was because Lincoln was assassinated. Now, obviously, he didn't say he was treated worse than Lincoln. He said he was treated worse than Lincoln by the media. 
Trump was not, he was not, uh, Lincoln was not assassinated by the media. He was assassinated by an actor. And Trump is, has been treated badly by actors as well, but not as badly as Lincoln. I'll give them that. But even when he complains about the press, they lie about him. Even when he complains that he's being mistreated and his comments distorted by the press, they distort his comments and lie about him and treat him unfairly. So they can't stop. They literally cannot stop. And this is the thing that keeps getting me because I know a lot. I've been in the press. I've been a reporter. I've been in journalism. And I know these people and I know that they're not bad people. And I wonder, like, when you have to distort what somebody is saying, as obviously as you did there, not to mention Charlottesville, not to mention drinking Clorox or whatever, all that distortion. Do you never say to yourself, if I have to keep distorting what he says, is he really saying that? And am I not lying? I mean, I look at things all the time where it'll say so-and-so right-winger def- destroys left-winger. And I'll look at it and think, hey, he didn't destroy him. And I won't play it. Or I will play it and say that that's the truth. If you're distorting and lying, ask yourselves why you have to do that. All right. Let us talk for just a moment about the double tumbler promo, because, you know, we still have to save the claim. And it, obviously, this is our main principle, our main project that we all have to do, because remember, you only exist in my imagination. So if I go, everybody goes. But we, while we continue to do that, we have to remember that the deal for two Leftist Tears Tumblers is coming to an end tomorrow. When you become a Daily Wire Insider Plus or an all-access member, you get two of the magnificent, unbreakable, solid gold, diamond encrustic Leftist Tears Tumbler, which are different from other, all other solid gold left diamond encrusted tumblers by not being solid gold or diamond encrusted. So act now before it's too late and existing members, we will have a deal for you as well. Daily Wire members get all the amazing benefits. You get the app, you get uh, three hours of the Ben Shapiro show, you get uh, no an ad free experience and you get to be in the mailbag. So all your problems are solved. What else can you ask for? Come over to dailywire.com and subscribe just like our sponsors support us and we need their support. We need your support as well. So come on over and become a member. So speaking about the press and how it's the press is the story and how it has come uh, become naked in this moment. Let's go back to the Biden story, uh, because you heard us covering this way before anybody else really picked it up. We've been hammering at it because it's about the press. You know, it's it's interesting. Uh, Tara Reid, the woman who accused Biden of attacking her, um, you know, she is she is withheld comment. Apparently she canceled a Fox News show and she's withheld comment after uh, Biden did an interview with Mika Brzezinski on Morning Joe. She says she wants to think about how she's going to respond. Now, I don't know if that means she's going to say, oh, it was all a lie. It was all a hoax. I have no idea. And I, I hope she doesn't only because then the press will say, oh, look, all the conservatives were wrong. And, and uh, you know, she was lying. It's not about that. It is seriously. It is not about Joe Biden yet. It is about Joe Biden when there's enough proof and we see what's going on. But right now, this is about the press. Let me read you a little bit of a New York Times editorial that came out over the weekend saying that this has to be investigated. Very serious from the New York Times editorial board. They say, as is so often the case in such situations, it's all but impossible to be certain of the truth, which is not what they said with Kavanaugh. But the stakes are too high to let the matter fester or the stakes are too high to leave it to be investigated by and adjudicated by the media. (laughs) <laughs> Let's not let the press investigate this. That would be wrong. It would be wrong for the press to say, quote, every woman who says anything about Joe Biden. And notice how all the other women who say that Joe Biden treated them inappropriately have vanished, where with Kavanaugh, they were all piled on on top of the original accusation. But with Biden, it's like out the door with them. It's just this one thing. Once we disprove this, it'll be fine. And they say in 2018, this board, the editorial board, advocated strongly for a vigorous inquiry into accusations of sexual misconduct raised against Brett Kavanaugh when he was nominated to a seat on the Supreme Court. Mr. Biden's pursuit of the presidency requires no less. Now, they were, what they called for was the FBI to investigate Kavanaugh. What they're calling for now is the DNC. The Democratic National Committee should move to investigate the matter swiftly and thoroughly with the full cooperation of the Biden campaign. That'll be reliable. We can trust the DNC. We don't want the FBI to do it. We don't want the press to do it. No, no, no. 
It is amazing to me. It is just amazing to me. And again, I don't think that these are sinister cartoon villains going, ah, now we'll lie about this. I think they are truly, truly self-deceived. They must be. They must be self-deceived. No one could behave this badly naked in front of everyone. They are the emperor. They really are the emperor who thinks he is wearing magic clothes that he can't see, but everybody else can see. It, it's and and you want listen to them to def- deflect. They'll say, "Well, Trump, Trump also had all these problems with women." Is it's about the press? Is anybody going to argue that Trump's problems have not been investigated? That accusations have not come forward about Trump? Is anybody are going to argue that the uh, press has gone easy on Donald Trump? No, it's not about that. It is about the difference between the way they cover Democrats and the way they cover Republicans. It, it, you know, so let's let's take a look at Mika Brzezinski. She did a decent job uh, interviewing Biden. It is not her fault that the rest of the press has been gone so easy on him. She did ask fair questions. Here's uh, cut three. He says Biden, by the way, said it never happened. This, this thing never happened. Do you regret what you said during the Kavanaugh hearings? What I said during the Kavanaugh hearings was that she had a right to be heard. And the fact that she came forward, the presumption would be she's telling the truth unless it's proved she wasn't telling the truth. Or not proved, unless it's clear from the facts surrounding it, it's not the truth. As we... uh, This is a very... I'm sorry. Go ahead. Please. Sleepy Joe Biden, who has no clue what the hell he's doing. (laughs) So, So, so... What he said was, oh, she has to be heard, but that's not what he said originally. Play cut five. This is what he was saying before. Women should be believed. The presumption should be if the woman comes forward, she's likely telling the truth as a presumption that the man is telling the truth. I believed her when she came forward. We want to make it real clear. It's on us. It's on everyone to intervene, to stop abuse when they see it. Silence is complicity. (laughs) <laughs> so it was a much, much different, you know, then the issue was, it's like the issue is women. You know, I wrote this novel, True Crime, in which there's a funny routine that one of the editors do about how they choose the issue, what issue it is. Right. So now then with Kavanaugh, the issue was women. Now the issue is Joe Biden. Now it's Joe Biden. I like Nancy Pelosi. I think said Joe Biden is Joe Biden. That should be his campaign slogan. There's something else here, too, by the way, I, you know, going back, I was going back through some old videos of what he said back in the day, right? He was a different human being. He was a different person. One year ago, one year ago, he was just a different guy. I mean, listen, here's, well, here's just from September, okay? Just from September of, well, I think this is September of 18th. uh, Try cut six. How would you suggest that the uh, that the Senate handle these allegations? I think they should do an FBI investigation. We did that for Anita Hill. Took two days, number one. And number two, most importantly, Anita Hill was vilified when she came forward by a lot of my colleagues, character assassination. I wish I could have done more to prevent those questions the way they asked them. I hope my colleagues learn from that, learn from that. She deserves to be treated with dignity. It takes enormous courage for a woman to come forward and the bright lights of millions of people watching and relive something that happened to her, assert that something happened to her. And she should be treated with respect. That's about two years ago. That's about two. That's a different man. He's, he speaks then with clarity. Uh, you know, he's not, he was never, the guy was always as dumb as a doorknob, but like still, he speaks with clarity. He can finish his sentence. He doesn't get lost. He doesn't forget things. That's only two years ago. Uh, you know, the guy, I mean, I, I said this a couple of, a, a while back, the guy is deteriorating in front of our eyes. That is not the same person that is talking today. And that's another thing they're just not covering. It just doesn't exist. It's all evil right wingers and evil. You know, it's just like Tybee said, it's all about the person who makes the charge, not about what's actually happening. That's a different guy than is talking now. This guy has deteriorated in a very, very short period of time while no one is covering it. And so, you know, the the fact, you know, Martha Raddatz had um, uh, Ronald McDaniel, the uh, head of the RNC on, and she actually said, although I have to say Martha had the the, uh, good nature to drop her eyes and not look at the cameras, she said it. She said, no, ABC has been covering this Biden story. ABC has been covering this. And Ronald McDonald opened up and let her have it. And it was such a, I'm going to play it because it's such so precise that it is amazing that Martha Raddatz could think that ABC has covered the story and there's no double standard. 
Okay. I'm going to take issue with the media ignoring this. It has been appalling the hypocrisy as to how Brett Kavanaugh was treated versus Joe Biden. Brett Kavanaugh, every accuser was put on TV. It was wall-to-wall -wall coverage. They went into his high school yearbook. They said he needed an FBI investigation. Michael Avenatti was on TV accusing him of gang rape from an accuser who'd never even met Brett Kavanaugh. And then you go to Joe Biden. Five weeks of silence. 19 interviews without a single question. He won't let people go into his records in the University of Delaware. Where. They're calling on the DNC to do the investigation. It went from me to me to me to to move on, move on, move on in a nanosecond because he's a Democrat. And the hypocrisy is appalling. And it's not just from the Democrats, it's from the media. And I'll tell you, I think any outlet that conducted those 19 interviews and didn't ask a single question should be disqualified from conducting any part of a presidential debate. One of the things about democratic governance, about debating with people that you seriously disagree with, is that if you can, if it's possible, it is really helpful to attribute goodwill to your opponent. This is one of the things that the Democrats have done that has really made it impossible for us to have debates. They basically call us racist. They call us sexist. They call us phobic this, phobic that. We're bigots. We're an evil. We're this and that. And we've always said this, that the right thinks the left is wrong. The left thinks the right is evil. If you attribute goodwill to your opponent, and I know you obviously can't always do this, but if you can do it, you will get a much more clear sense of who they are and what they're trying to say. So let's attribute goodwill to Martha Raddus. I mean, that was, you know, that what Ronna McDonald said, every word of that was true. Every word of that was precise, accurate, and detailed and true. And my question is this. Okay, Martha Raddus is over at ABC. I think she's at, that's at ABC. Uh, where George Stephanopoulos is killing stories about Jeffrey Epstein, for all we know. But surely, surely at some point, she starts to think, wait a minute, wait a minute. Th that's true. We did not cover this the same way. I mean, surely when she dropped her eyes from the camera, there was something inside her going clickety, click, click. Is there a point where these people start to say, hey, you know what? We're not covering the news in a fair way. I mean, there was a story in Hollywood Reporter about how tired these poor reporters are uh, uh, from covering um, from covering Trump. And at one point, a senior uh, CNN producer says, as journalists, I don't think anybody cares about what party the president of the United States is. What they care about is being able to live their lives normally again. Are they that self-deceived? And can they become undeceived? That is actually one of the biggest political questions we're facing right now. All right. A final uh, reflection over the weekend. You know, we've been trying to watch kind of classic movies, but also we've been I've been listening uh, to uh, Woody Allen's uh, autobiography, apropos of nothing. And as you remember, Woody Allen's biography was going to be published and then the uh, left wing fascists who worked at the publishing house went out on strike, basically saying no, because he was accused of uh, um, molesting his daughter in a an accusation that he completely denies. And so they actually canceled the contract to publish his book and it's been put out, I think, by Amazon or something like that. I, it's not a big publisher, but it's, it is out. It's called Apropos of Nothing. I'm not a Woody Allen fan. I, I really dislike the man personally. I can't stand him when I see him on TV acting normally. I think his films are okay, but overrated. This book is terrific. I've always maintained that Woody Allen's best work was his early work in The New Yorker. They're called casual pieces that he wrote for The New Yorker. And if you go back and look at, um, what's it called? Uh, Getting Even, I think. I think his the book is called Getting Even. It's probably one of the top funniest books ever written by an American. It is one of the funniest things I have ever read, and I read a lot of funny stuff, and it's hard to do. It is an incredibly funny book. He's an incredibly funny writer. This is an, an honest look at a very, very damaged guy. He depicts himself as a damaged person. He shows himself to be damaged, and there's a lot of uh, lack of awareness about his own damage. A lot of things where he keeps saying, no, I had a wonderful childhood. I don't know where this came from. And then you listen to his childhood and think like, yeah, I'm starting to see where this came from. He, 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 as he himself says, his psychotherapy has never helped him at all. He is just a damaged guy. So anyway, in keeping with watching this uh, book, with reading this book, and I'll get back and say more about it when I finish it. Uh, my wife and I watched uh, Play It Again, Sam, which was from 1972. And it was not directed by Allen, but it was based on a, a stage play he wrote in which he admired uh, Casablanca so much that he wanted to be Humphrey Bogart and the ghost of Humphrey Bogart, Bogart starts to come and tell him how to pick up girls, how to meet girls. And here is a, the funniest scene in the movie where he tries to pick up a girl in an art museum uh, in San Francisco. It's quite a lovely Jackson Pollock, isn't it? 
Yes, it is. What does it say to you? It restates the negativeness of the universe, the hideous, lonely emptiness of existence, nothingness, the predicament of man forced to live in a barren, godless eternity, like a tiny flame flickering in an immense void with nothing but waste, horror and degradation forming a useless, bleak straitjacket in a black, absurd cosmos. What are you doing Saturday night? Committing suicide. What about Friday night? <laughs> That's the funniest line in the movie. It's really inter- What's really interesting is the movie is not very funny. Uh, you know, I, rem- I remember it as being absolutely hilarious. I remember cracking up once so hard that I actually banged my head on the uh, seat back in front of me in the theater. Uh, it's not that funny. It's a lot of uh, physical humor, a lot of slapstick, throwing things around. Uh, I've always, I've always just thought the guy was overrated, but he is in when he's funny. He is as funny as it's possible to be. And I think his funniest stuff is on the page. I think his so far, uh, I'm, I, I'm about maybe about halfway through his autobiography, apropos of nothing so far. It is absolutely terrific. And he's just, he is a guy, I don't know. He's just, it's just an interesting thing. You know, he and the people he knows the very successful entertainers that he knows are all such damaged people that I'm just reminded of the problem with our entertainers, uh, is not that they're damaged and not that they're bad people. It's that we listen to their opinions, that their opinions are asked at all. Why anybody should ask an entertainer what he thinks about politics is a complete mystery to me. Why they should make speeches about it, complete mystery to me. They should shut up and sing because really they're just too damaged. Almost not all of them, but a lot of them. They're so damaged uh, that they really should question their own opinions and how important they should be to the rest of us. That is really the, the question. Anyway, Woody Allen, apropos of nothing, really entertaining book so far. Played against him. Eh, you could skip it. All right, I'll talk to you again tomorrow. I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Robert Sterling and directed by Mike Joyner. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. And our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Assistant director, Pavel Wydowski. Edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio mixed by Robin Fenderson. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. Production assistants, McKenna Waters and Ryan Love. The Andrew Clavin Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. If you prefer facts over feelings, aren't offended by the brutal truth, and you can still laugh at the insanity filling our national news cycle, well, tune in to The Ben Shapiro Show. We'll get a whole lot of that and much more. See you there. Mm-hmm.